Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of I Don't Give a Flick. I'm your host, Johnny Blackburn, and with me as always is my co-host, Mr. Gary Elmore. It's good to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, yes, thanks, it's good to be here. Coming. Yeah, appreciate uh, it. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Uh-huh. Wow, you're wow, you're yeah, I'm talking take, a lot today. I'm feeling, taking off. You're you feeling know? chipper. We got okay. it. We got it going. I'm glad. It's like eleven PM yeah. out here. Central so. Standard Time. Yeah, Central Standard Time. So uh, from here on in, I shoot without a script. You shoot without a script. Uh, Neil Riley is off this week. Uh, we'll be back with us next episode. Um, but we are incredibly grateful and and ecstatic, really. No, overjoyed. Oh, you're lost for words. Lost yes. for can't even fathom a coherent sentence to say how we are uh, extreme jubilation. Yes. one might say. Johnny is really never lost for words. No, I'll just even if I'll just make up words, even yes. if they have, even if they're not, it's not descriptive to, to know, what I'm actually feeling or trying to talk about. Uh, this week we welcome back uh, the local uh, Austin cinematographer and legend, Gaffer. really. What's up? L- legend, really. Legend, really. Yeah. The one, the, the only, only, the PJ. indefatigable. Jesus Christ, Gary, shut up. BJ Llewellyn. Pew, 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 pew. BJ, welcome What's back. up, guys? Glad you could be joining What's us. What's going on? Be joining us. Thanks for having me Indeed. out. Indeed. And then uh, for the first time ever in the history of I Don't Give a Flick, we are welcoming to the stage a man who needs no introduction, but insists on having one anyway, anyways because he's a bit of a narcissist. Oh, wow. That's a <laughs> that's a brand new thing, Johnny. You've never said that before on, on this podcast. On air, I have never said the yeah. word narcissist. Probably not a good way to introduce a guest and hope they come back yeah. later on in the series. No. That's probably a horrible idea. Uh, <laughs> uh, pr- uh, producer and uh, first, second AD, line producer, uh, my good friend Matt McGinley. Matt, welcome to the show. Well, good afternoon, gentlemen. And it's, uh, you know, I like to take my narcissism down from like a nine. If you're at a nine right now. I need you at a four. I, okay. okay. I appreciate that. All you're, right. You're a good man. Uh, so Matt is actually uh, Matt is actually calling us from LA, where he currently resides. Los Angeles, Hollywood, Los Angeles. That's right, Los Angeles. Uh, I think it means in Spanish a whale's vagina. I, I think it means so. the a- Angeles. No, no, no. That's not accurate. Oh, okay. So you can put that in your pipe and smoke it, Gary. Uh, Matt, since you're uh, this is your first uh, episode with us here, before we get into our topic, uh, why don't you go ahead and give a little back, uh, background on uh, on yourself? Yeah, and... who are you? Tell me a little bit about yourself. <laughs> Tell... Wow, is this, is this a, is Dr. Phil? Is, is, is he coming on board? He, that, if you know Dr. Phil and he wants to come on an episode, I don't give a shit if he doesn't know anything about uh, film. He's you welcome. Mean, you mean you don't give a flick? I don't give a flick. Very <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, for God's sake, Matt. Well, uh, well, so, I mean, we, we all went to school together, Johnny. We went Correct. to school for acting. We did. We went. Trying to, to, be, trying to be actors. Theater. Uh, yes. I've been out here in L.A. for 11 years uh, with the dream of being an actor. And I, I learned uh, died fast. very early on that um, <laughs> there's a lot of people out here. There's a, there's lot, a lot of, of actors. A lot of, a lot of actors, you know. Uh, but... Uh, you know the real uh, the real equation is is creating a team of people and a group of people who have good hearts, and creating your own projects and and that's kind of like what I'm doing now. Okay. okay. Uh, so so what, currently what what have you uh, what have you been working on recently um, and just you know some of the some of the network shows you've been on indie films commercials and stuff like that kind of give us a give us your resume if you will so people know how important you are out there. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, started started in indies. Uh, got got a lucky break. Uh, I had a TV producer give me a, a PA job, uh, and uh, that it was for, for a show called uh, Assistant. Shut yeah. up, Gary. Production. <laughs> I, I call it a production asset. Okay, a production oh, asset. Oh, like oh, I, like like I like that. I like that. After my own heart. The lifeblood. You know, if, if you know, you got to get your coffee right. You know, you got to get your your lunch your lunch orders right. You got to do it in you know like an um, accent. You know, hey, hey, it's me. You want some lunch? Hey, hey. <laughs> uh, but but yeah, I I got a an office job uh, for like a day, and uh, from there I loaded a truck. And this and this this uh, technical designer was like, you know what, son, you got you got moxie. You got a lot of moxie. And I was like, oh, I hate wow. moxie. <laughs> Get out of here, kid. You'll never work in this town again. <laughs> and uh, from there, uh, got on a, a an indie film 
for for a month and uh kind of the rest is history uh just was working off referrals uh for about two years uh just you know based on my line of work my my, my work ethic uh and then now now I'm line producing and ADing. Okay. So. Okay. Well. And you said you were working. Sweet. When we talked last, you were working for uh, what show was it? It was on History Channel or TLC. I can't remember. Yeah, it was History, History Channel, Channel. Okay. Uh, called uh, "The Unexplained" with William Shatner. So let me let me ask you a question. <laughs> that sounds awesome. So let, let me ask you a question. Yeah, he's a he's a he's a cool guy. So the History Channel when I was a kid used to be one of my absolute favorite channels. And that was, you know, in the mid nineties when oh the, I think they started in 95 and then, yeah. how did it used to be Gary back in the back day, back in the day, back in my day. Um, and then they kind of switched from doing like historical, um, you know, programs to more of a, Hey, American pickers. Hey, um, Pawn stars. Pawn stars. The one you hate. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, <laughs> so, I mean, when you were working uh, with the History Channel, was there any sense of kind of like, you know, we've we're not kind of doing the same kind of content we used to? Well, that's the tricky thing about, uh, you know, TV versus feature films versus music videos versus commercials. Like they're all different beasts. The, the, the one main tie centrally is production. Um, but it's how that production is strategized and pitched and bought and and tv is is it's, it's a tricky thing especially reality tv i know you know that johnny uh and you know there's <laughs> yes. a bunch of bosses uh, you know more in tv versus feature films okay right so i, I so I, I, we're on a podcast number 10 this is our 10th episode everyone congratulations <laughs> congratulations what a weird time to announce this is our 10th episode. Everyone, plug it. Why are you announcing this right now? minutes into it, I want everybody to know we're on episode <laughs> plug 10. It. Why didn't you um, say it at the I beginning of the episode? I flick. <laughs> Gary, this is, wow, this is horrible timing we'll, to we'll do that. We'll fix it in post. We'll fix it in post. We're not going to stop saying that. We're not fixing it in post. Horrible, horrible. Anyways, guys, uh, so today's topic, we're going to be uh, kind of delving actually into a lot of different uh, uh, facets of film and the industry. Altogether, we'll probably go a little further into the industry today than we have in recent episodes. Uh, we will be talking about the current uh, structure and status of uh, production, filming production in not only Texas and Austin, but also Los Angeles and out in the Southwest. Um, Has there been anything that disrupted production? Uh, you know, I just think people just stopped wanting to watch movies. Yeah, okay. You know, that, I think these people enough. get tired of yeah. the film and they don't watch TV anymore. Yeah, and, you know, they want to uh, go outside and, you know. Yeah, and yeah, just enjoy play. the fresh air. Yeah, get you know? a hula hoop go or something. Go for a hike and hula hoop, yeah. yeah. On their lunch break. And go to a bar yeah. and get some, get some, you know, get beers with all your yeah. friends. Yeah. Some marbles, yeah. Yeah. you know. Yeah. That's good. Go to a parade, yeah. you know. You know, but, see, go join an improv group. Um, so we'll be talking a little about that and then we'll kind of, uh, we'll transition into how the industry is kind of putting their play-by-play -play of how they're going to be coming out of coronavirus uh, once all that once all the dust settles. Uh, and then from there, we'll kind of transition into uh, the status right now of indie films and how they're marketing indie films and the fast rise of, uh, um, of really anybody who wants to direct mm -hmm. being able to direct at this point because there's so many options right. on and how to market your film and get it out there. Yeah, and it's the, such a low threshold for entry nowadays oh, because you don't have to, um, I mean, you can just have a, a home computer and do all the editing you need. And we'll talk more about that later, but it's just really lowered the barriers to start making your own movies. Anybody can film it. Even point. Neil Breen. Even, I was just about to call oh, Neil Breen. Oh, beat you to it. Oh. Uh, yeah, well, okay. Um, just, I, I have to say, this Gary and I have been watching. This is Stop the podcast <laughs> Episode 10. 10. For God's sake. Ah, no one's going to listen this week. Anybody <laughs> listen last week? Probably not. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. I listened. <laughs> Was I last week? Oh, you, shit. You were. You were last week. Congratulations. That's right. I mean, oh, I mean, of course, no one's going to listen. No, BJ, everybody, Thank everybody you. listened everybody. to your episode. Everybody listened. Everybody loves you. Um, they just hate us. Uh, so there, Gary and I have been watching these movies by a director named Neil Breen, uh, B R E E N, mm -hmm. uh, Neil Breen. And he is honest. I think we may have brought him up in the last episode, but I'm going to talk about him again. I mean, the guy literally, he does crowdfunding through, you know, Indiegogo or, um, he used to, whatever. now he's looking for legitimate <laughs> investors because he, he wants to have investors. a professional production. B but this guy, he writes, directs, edits, does the makeup and costuming, 
uh, stars. Cast. And and you can tell. You yeah. can tell. His his five movies over the last fifteen years are just they're just atrocious. I mean they're they're just a hot fucking mess. And I, I don't even want to go into detail on all of them, but Gary and I have been on a, a trip lately of watching movies so bad they're good. Oh, um, that sounds like a plug for another podcast. It might be. Oh. Or, yeah, Ian Webb, you're welcome. Um, but it's just the, these movies are just so bad they're horrible. Mm-hmm. The movies so bad they're they're piles of flaming dog shit. Yep. I mean, it's yep. Yep. it's it's just. I think you're starting to channel the Top Gear Dacia Sandero thing, where they always talk about the absolute worst car that's just absolutely oh. nothing. And you know what? Oh. They get given the new versions of it because the people just love that they even talk about it. I, I could imagine. I could imagine. And you know, maybe we'll get maybe we'll get some uh, get DVDs this, or Blu-rays yeah. so. or you know, premiere post, pre- post distro. That's post distro right there. Uh, pr- premiere invites to the Neil. Next Neil Breen yeah. movie. You know, he yeah. just came out with his own, uh, it was like a five disc set uh, on filmmaking. It was, yeah, a five hour set on five filmmaking. Hours. Jesus Christ. Um, <laughs> the, which, we were watching a Red Letter mm. Media episode the other night where the guys actually sat down to the host and watched the five hour filmmaking series. Yeah. And uh, I, I can't believe they didn't rip their hair out. Anyways, going on past that. Um, so let's just dive right into it. Uh, Matt, uh, kind of give us a little update on what's going on with the current, uh, the current climate out in LA. Obviously, for the first, you know, through March and April, basically film production ceased anything. I mean, we halted completely. How's it been going over the last six weeks for you guys? Well, uh, I was currently on a uh, feature film in New Mexico uh, at the end of March. Uh, obviously got shut down. Right. Uh, prior to that, I had 11 jobs push push on me over the course of four days. And it, it was just, it was nuts. I can imagine. Uh, currently right now, um, we are we're still working on that, uh, uh, the feature film, uh, New Mexico, hopefully certain start up, start back up around, uh, late June. Uh, and then also a TV show for HGTV, uh, shooting in Atlanta, uh, in October. But the big main thing right now is playbook. And that's, that's the, 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 the coin term, which kind of sounds cool. It's like playbook, uh, for, for productions now uh-huh. in, the, in the climate we live in and you know uh just the strategy of of what set life is going to look like once it starts back okay. up okay so the pl- oh the, yeah because the, 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 it's crazy okay, so the playbook is basically i guess a set of guidelines for how to produce uh, a production it's like safety regulations that people have to follow or what, what is it exactly correct correct and i i it, Honestly, a lot of it goes back to your COI, uh, uh, your insurance, uh, and and how you're going to convince an insurance company to back a production uh, in the current climate we live in, uh, you know. And so, it's 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 just interesting. It's uh, it's sad, kind of as well, with uh, specifically craft services. It's like there's not going to be any craft services on set. Mm-hmm. Do they know how long that's supposed to last for? Uh, I haven't heard any any updates, but it's going to be for sure the first six months. Okay, That's all right be then. Tough. I I can't imagine running a twelve hour day with with no coffee, uh, no Welch's fruit packets. I'm pretty sure uh, uh, SAG AFTRA won't let that happen, so that'll be interesting to see how well, the, SAG, the guild. That's only for the actors, right? We're talking about crew, right? But I, I mean, the the crew have their own guilds, correct? Well, yeah, not not all of them. Right, but I mean, like, um, I'm, I'm sure there's going to be some interesting balance between the uh, the production companies and the guilds on how right. to uh, make that equitable for everybody. So, have, have you guys? So, I mean, Matt, have you guys come across any um, any current or former colleagues that you've worked with before that are currently working over the last couple of weeks? Um, I guess you're you're uh, not, but. Anybody else that you've talked to that has? Just uh, I, talent, really. I've, I've talked to talent. Okay. Uh, they've booked some commercials uh, starting up next week. But it kind of goes back to the playbook. Right. Uh, everything is 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 booked and pre-ordered, and this is your lunch, and you get it here, and you're isolated uh-huh. here, okay. and, and and production companies spending, you know, X, X amount of dollars on masks, you right. know, for everybody, because everyone has to wear a mask and essential personnel on set. Right. Okay. Have, now, have they said what particular positions that might be what we would call excessive or overflow? Um, Non-essential. Might be, 
yeah, and yeah. non-essential, that would be reduced moving forward. So, like, typically, you know, you might have five PAs on set. Are they limiting it now to two? You know, or are they getting rid of the second ADs for, you know, bigger commercials? Uh, I don't know, stuff like that. Well, I mean, it's, it's going to definitely be streamlined a lot more. Uh, kind of goes goes back to more of, like, the indie in the uh, formula, you know, uh, central personnel. But uh, what I can say is I think there's going to be a lot more production assets, PAs on set. Uh, there's going to be more. Just because yeah, there's going to be more. All, all, they're going to be scattered, but they're also going to, you know, half of them are going to be doing runs for the crew, okay. for the cast. Uh, also, the 399s, the Teamsters, there's going to be a lot more of them hired. Really? Because they're going to have to have a lot more mohos, uh, you know, uh, the, you know, the uh, motorhomes. Right. Uh, on set to isolate the cast because like okay. that's the big thing is if if one of these cast members get you know get sick right. you know the production company is you know liable and the production is shut down okay so let's let's train and I'll, i have a couple questions for both you guys but um but bj let's transition to the the texas film scene currently so obviously like in la correct me if i'm wrong um i i know it, i i personally like i haven't my my normal like reality TV show gigs and any smaller commercial indie gigs I've gotten out here have I haven't gotten any calls for three months. Uh, what about you? Yeah, what I mean, basically, time? yeah. Uh, unfortunately, specifically in Texas, our big kind of almost I would say our big thing of the year, but a really big thing in Austin is like South by Southwest, and this right. happened right as that went on. So the first thing that happened is they canceled South by all these jobs that I had that were coming into there. And then a lot of people had all just completely went away. Right. So most of that completely evaporated and every major TV show and movie shooting has completely come to a halt. Uh, I've done a couple of weird little small jobs um, that have all been of questionable, you know, <laughs> like, Hey, like maybe this is cool. Maybe this is not. But then at the same time, I actually worked on a music video for an upcoming artist out of nashville and we were 100 percent covered for coronavirus really we you know everybody had masks on we all did our best and maintained social distance you know it was a very small crew that was super minimal with a couple of cameras and basically one person holding a camera and you were your everything no one's passing you anything right. There's no, you brought your own water. We didn't do anything like that. You, it was all exterior. So we were well ventilated, but you know, we were covered. And in fact, they were saying like, yo, if, you know, make sure you get tested over the next two weeks, because if something happens you will absolutely be covered by our insurance related to this yeah. coronavirus. So That's there's things that are adapted to it, but it's just, you know, it's a different world. But as far as real production goes, they're all still totally stopped. That's, cra that's, that's crazy, crazy because that's it, it sounds honestly like a producer's wet dream almost. And, and let me explain. So, I mean, you know, you talk about it being minimalist and, you know, so less people to pay. You know, now you've got typically, you know, a DP's got his what his first AC um, or maybe, you know, a video PA helping him out or something, handing him handing him his lenses and all that. And now what you're saying, yeah. they just have what to do it all themselves. So they're well, they're it is, costs, but it's like, it's also the sake of you get what you pay for. You know, right. like normally mm -hmm. the reason that all these positions exist is to make everyone be able to work better on their job. Right. You know, like I um, I don't know how, you know, I know things in the indie world are a little bit different and depending on. But sometimes when you're on smaller sets, you know, like a lot of times a, a, f a few amount of people are wearing a lot of hats. They're doing a lot of the same yep. positions at work. And when I'm when I have eight different hats on, I start to miss more things that I'm not noticing because I have so many other jobs that I'm doing. Mm. So one of the reasons you have so many of these jobs is because you can have a person looking for hair that's flying away you can have somebody monitoring the sound you can have somebody prepping the next lens so that you're in the right world versus like on this particular job we needed another piece of equipment from the camera which would have been totally easy to reg call for my first or second ac to bring it out to me while we shot something but instead it was like okay well either we can take 30 minutes and i can go drive to this off location and get it or we can deal without it mm -hmm. and so you work without yeah. it you know and that makes life more difficult for the crew so you know it just kind of has a different give and take uh but the main one is that the the main take is that most people aren't working right so hopefully texas is just yeah they're really hungry texas has just announced it opened as of like last yeah. week so mm -hmm. it's current it? um so the first week of june they did declare that it is open but uh you know just because 
you, you can declare bankruptcy, but that doesn't really mean much unless you actually have a lot, you know, the, the proof to go with it. We'll see how that goes. Yeah, and I, I would say that uh, in terms of a producer, this would like not be a wet dream because, you know, the most yeah. expensive part of a, of making something is the actual production and not having enough people will slow that down. So if you're shooting a, you know, say a 10 day production that normally would take 10 days and not having enough people adds on two or three days, that's e even if you were to have hired more people, that's going to extend yeah. the cost of the production far beyond, you know, what you would normally have. But you're not going to have, you're not going to have those same type of like a production that's going to last 10 days with a normal lot of people. Those aren't the type of productions being shot currently. The ones right. they're probably talking about are just going to be naturally smaller in general. Mm -hmm. So I could see, I mean, I could see like the insurance being a whole lot more obviously because not only do you have your standard physical liabilities, if somebody were to be seriously injured, uh, you've also got, you know, uh, I guess viral injury, you know, or viral uh, infection at this point because of the virus going around. So uh, to me, it would just seem like, you know, you're going to have to have less equipment. If it's already a small crew, you're going to mm -hmm. have to have an even smaller crew. So it would seem like they'd save a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, nobody can really, you know, the heads of each team can't really complain about people not being there and doing their job. They just have to go out and do everything themselves. Right. Anyway, so I don't know. Um, yeah. Well, to yeah. piggyback on what BJ was saying, uh -huh. uh, it, 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 a, a producer told me one time, best piece of advice, he's like, you could be a Swiss army knife and wear a bunch of hats, or you could be a machete. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's, it, you kind of muddle, muddle the, uh, the, the workflow, you know, now. Sure. So let me let me ask you guys uh, for 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 both of you guys. So BJ, you said with the the few shoots that you've been on over the last couple of weeks, uh, most people have. I'm assuming most of these are fairly low budget indie shoots where certain yeah, procedures I mean, are for the most part. Yeah. So what are they doing currently? Just on these small ones, I'm sure they're non union. I'm oh, guessing. What are they doing? Well, the, the current thinking? yeah, the current kind of main thing that's even gone on is that uh, everyone. It absolutely maintains all the distance possible right. and it's always a thing especially on union jobs that you don't touch anything that's not yours just like a because you shouldn't and b because you never know when something is particularly said in some way that is like very important you know like something easy to be if you bump a table and knock something over or you know knock something out of the way like you might have just messed up continuity right. you don't want to go touch any person the camera stuff you don't want to do this kind of stuff anyway but now it's very watched after like don't touch anyone's shit don't try to help them if they need help doing something else because okay. all you're doing is infecting them and causing them to have to slow things down and and then clean whatever you've done to help nope. so right. nope. Are, that's the biggest one are you guys both seeing uh, at least like the bare minimum like are you seeing these companies provide the face masks are you seeing them provide hand sanitizer are you seeing them put up like like tape down being like oh you know this person like you can eat lunch out here you can eat lunch out here you can eat lunch over in that corner like are they at least providing that like the bare minimum or are they just be like hey you got to bring well, i think stuff. i think it, it starts it starts in the start paperwork you know you get the all the contracts and everything in your in your packet uh, to say what you're saying X Y and Z. Right. Um, but yeah, it, there, everybody is 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 splitting up uh, minimal crews, and uh, you know they're hiring companies to provide these face masks at a wholesale cost. Um, and yeah, hand sanitizer stations, okay. etc. So it, it is it is mm -hmm. common to hear it that that people that at least these companies or the directors or if it's self-finance whatever at least they're providing that so that's that's good to hear um that they're at least trying that so you know coming from from both sides and and i hell, heck i even i can i can attest to this pretty well for just being able to make a living and pay your bills over the last couple months um you know how was it for you guys getting on if you are on on unemployment or i because i know when we first started this th there were a lot of people uh, when they were doing those um the relief packages mm -hmm. and stuff that congress was coming out with initially in the first draft that came out they did not include people in the media industry that this includes musicians this includes people that work yeah on independent contractors and it, yeah um but i remember in the initial first draft i don't remember who was in charge of writing it at that point but it was we were not included and I actually joined a couple of Facebook groups <laughs> that were like, hey, you know, before you guys pass this, don't forget about us. <laughs> like, you know, our entire industry has halted and we have no way of, of making any money at all. Um, so how, how was it for you guys? I mean, I think on the, the was it the second or third draft, I guess. Do you remember? 
Uh, when, not the specific one. No, okay. I don't remember. Um, but eventually, eventually, Congress did pass it to where all mm -hmm. freelancers and uh, s uh, subcontractors were allowed to um, get get uh, unemployment benefits. So um, for me, I actually had already gotten on it from uh, last summer when I mm. got laid off from Mood and started doing my film stuff full time. Right. Um, I, you know, I was already on it. So for me, it was just easy to snap a finger for you two. But how difficult was it? Did you guys have to call for like three weeks or... You know how 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 hard was it for you? You want you want to run for it first, and then I'll I can jump in. What what? However you want to go for it. I man. Uh, I mean, being a freelancer is is a difficult job, um, especially if you don't work for a major production company where you're an in-house, sure. you know, coordinator, line producer, um, you know, AD. Um, uh, for me, uh, it, it was. You can't call in Cal in LA or California. Yeah, you can't. Too many people. You can't even get through. Yeah, you can't even get through. Uh, and it's it's very specific and detailed, and you got to click this box and this box. Uh, I've had uh, I've had a couple of friends that work in the industry. One's a DIT, the other one's a coordinator, and uh, they put in too many production companies that they worked for, oh, no. and so their weekly allowance uh, went down. Uh, the, the, in in California, the the typical thing is four fifty a week, uh, and then I guess you get your plus your six hundred. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, but because they put this, this, and this, they were getting like ninety three a week. God, what? That's yeah. horrible. So what about you? Did you are are you on or did, did you have enough saved up with your other jobs that you're okay? Or uh, well, I had, luckily I had a couple a couple of uh you know checks come in. Uh, but no, I'm I'm fully 100 percent as of May <laughs> May May 25th. On, on, on uh, on sucking it. on the on Uncle Sam's teat. Gotcha. Wonderful yeah. image. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep, and uh, stories pretty similar here. A little bit different for Texas. They uh, they said, "Hey, we totally are you know letting on a lot of the people that are trying to get in. You just need to call us." Except you know all our phone lines are full. Yes. And I knew people that had yes. called literally over a thousand times trying to get through, um, and it was an absolute and complete cluster. Uh, I, however, was really lucky, and thankfully, just before this ended, I worked a fairly large job with a big medical company. Mm -hmm. And they were willing to help me get on and let me use them towards a reference. Yeah, and right. it got me in on the system. And, you know, I was able to get through. Finally, it took a couple of it took over a week of me logging in every day, trying things, doing all sorts of different, you know, every method possible and every trying different combinations of boxes ticked. Hmm. But finally, I got something that worked through and it's, it was like a low number that I got. I forget what it even came out to, mm -hmm. but then you got that 600 on top of it. Yeah. So uh, I'm just kind of hanging Blessings. out with that. And then I got, I was lucky enough to get my tiny little production company to get uh, the Payroll Protection Act. So That's I'm great. going Force to Force Majeure. figure that out. Majeure. Uh, no, just basically they, I applied, technically I have a, business account through like bank of america and since it's a business account through them i was able to apply kind of through some other methods and they basically just were like you know what sure whatever and i was like really but it's worked so uh nice. everything's gone through and if all everything goes according to the plan i will be rehiring any employees that were laid off by my company the last week of this month and they will be receiving payroll protection money and not right. uncle sam's money for a couple months okay well uh awesome. yeah um the good news is uh right now when we're filming this it's june 7th this will probably come out in july at some point but yeah. uh, uh, last week we uh, had a, a a jobs number that was uh added two and a half million jobs to the to the job roles so it looks like you know things are starting to recover and return back to normal so hopefully oh wait was that before or after they clarified their clerical error that was that they said oh actually uh it was uh, a, a little bit more than we thought right yeah that, that was that was the clarification i believe Oh, okay, cool. But, uh, you know, it's it's good that, you know, things are starting to reopen so people don't have to, you know, you guys can get back out there, we all can, and start making films and, yeah. you know, doing the things that, you know, why we're in this industry. Exactly. And I, and I think it's, 
you know, I, I've heard a lot of people in general talk. Uh, they've been, you know, they, they, they bad mouth like, you know, Texas Workforce Commission or like for out here or other state commissions and stuff. And now, granted, I, I had to use TWC for other unemployment stuff before. And they're, they're not the greatest. You know, I mean, they're probably a little bit better than like the DPS or something, you know. But at the same time, no, you know, nobody nobody saw this coming. Exactly. You know, this is not this is not a. A, a worldwide pandemic is not something that it's a happens. black swan event yeah yeah exactly it doesn't happen you know it happened what once a century like you know who who really saw it so um for as as bad as it was for the first four or six weeks that this whole thing started i think everything started to slow down um i know it's it's i'm glad to hear that the two of you guys were able to get on as well um and i'm glad to hear that you know at least for texas we're open back mm. up and hopefully for the next couple months we'll we'll be set and we'll be okay so i kind of wanted to i, I want to chat about this really quick this transitions really well into where are the large theater chains and where are the large theater like the theaters themselves what are they ready to come out with when all the theaters open back up in a couple weeks i personally think they are salivating right now at mm. the opportunity not only because they've been closed and they're not making nearly as much but i don't think they're making any money right now um with everything just going directly to streaming but you have three months over three months at this point of just these constant moviegoers and people wanting to get outside and they've been mm -hmm. they've just been you know quarantined in these tight little areas right. with a bunch of people and they want to get out and do something and so now you've got this buildup of all these like movie premieres that were supposed to come out and some of them didn't even end up going directly to streaming some of them are waiting for the summer to open mm -hmm. up um and so i think for the first four to eight weeks we're going to see a record number of sold out movies across the country uh, across the world honestly that's, you I, know, that, that's also going to be a problem in a lot of ways because you know if you have like three months worth of movies that all try and come out in you know four weeks you're going to have like you know not even though they may all be sold out you, you know that you're not going to have a whole lot of people oh, going to each one. Yeah. You, you might, and and even that because even then, even though they're opening, most of them are only going to open at you know twenty five to fifty percent right. capacity. But what? Um, so, like I said, a lot of those movies mm -hmm. that were supposed to come out, you know, in March, April, May, early June, did go streaming. A lot of them yeah. did go streaming, right. but some of the bigger ones wanted to hit the box office mm -hmm. coming out in July. Um, so even though they're there, yeah, there might be the the clustered portion of it, and you might see. But I'm 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 thinking long lines out the door at every Cinemark, every Alamo, every AMC, mm -hmm. every Regal across the country. Um, and I think it's going to be a very good time to be uh, in the movie theater business directly. Um, I, I, I think it's, it's just going to be... A very optimistic a, take from Johnny Blackburn. I, yeah, and I don't... <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's pretty optimistic. I mean, you know, it, what do you, it's possible. What do you guys think? It could be like that. <laughs> Do you think it's a revive of of uh, digital distribution versus uh, box box office I distribution? I think it is. I think uh, I, I think this is a good segue into our next point, anyways. But I think that yeah, I think you know we Matt and I were talking about this earlier that you know just the way that film is going, and we've said before, you know it's it's going towards the streaming services, it's going to the Netflix, Amazons, whatever. But I think this is yeah, I think it's going to be a massive influx of cash flow and a massive influx in popularity at least over the next two or three months. I'm thinking July through september almost mm -hmm. where we just see record number of turnout towards these movie theaters um and i think it, it's going to help them start to compete a little bit more with the streaming services at least through the end of the year but that's just me what do you guys think um i think that's a bit optimistic i do <laughs> think you know g granted the fact that um, you know, Texas is reopening. We're going to put aside the fact that I, of my beliefs on the reopening process of that thus far, but I think there's still a lot of trust that people haven't quite built up yet. Like definitely there will be some people that are going to totally be like, awesome theaters are open. I'm going to go. But I think a lot of people, it's going to take a while to change the public discourse back to really being fully comfortable in a lot of major cities with that many people yeah, packing into yeah. a place, I, I, you know, um, that's not to that. say it doesn't, it's not to say it doesn't happen by the end of the year, mm. but I think like when you're saying like by July, mm. I don't, I think maybe like come fall, if we haven't had a, uh, mm -hmm. you know, any kind of a second peak yet, yeah. then definitely that could start happening. But I think even with the stuff opening, it's going to be a bit more timid, but you know, that's kind of just, 
yeah predictions at this point i don't yeah, know I, no one really yeah, knows i, I think it's yeah. going to come surging back i think people are tired of being in their homes i think that they're going to go out i mean you know you, you've seen this um with the, the riots all over you know people are but like you've seen them go out and like they don't really care about the covid anymore it's you know people wanting to go out and interact with other human beings and i think that that's going to overcome any of the fear that covid may have had you know yeah um and, absolutely yeah and, and you know i mean i think it's i think it's it's just one of the you know people are yeah they, they're just tired of being shut in you know um so yeah you're right i think in in some cities you're probably right bj like i i like in new york and maybe in boston like probably like the northeast cities where it's the really dense ones crowded. yeah, yeah. I, I think yeah popular where the the population is just yeah it's it's just more uh, it's just just more uh, squished together, um, what, consolidated. Yeah. What I want to see, what I want to see, is a, a, a spreadsheet within like a year or something like that of the movies, uh, feature films that were uh, supposed to come out, you know, during during the pandemic, uh, uh -huh. that gain box office, uh, you know, net, you know, based on it not coming out at that time, you know, now it's here now, now people can go out. Now people have been put into, you know, in their house for X, X number of days and weeks. Like, yeah. and it, it got, it got notoriety. It got, it kind of gained legs. They could put stuff on social media, uh, strategy. Like I, I, I want to see like the success of, of C and B movies that, that are like, Oh, like this actually did well. Like we actually got our ROI. Okay, so yeah, uh, that could be really interesting. Do, do you think that um, this uh, sort of delay and disruption to the normal, op, you know, the normal business of Hollywood is going to provide space for uh, smaller, more independent movies to kind of move in in terms of like the the theater chains, or uh, are you saying more just total in terms of like streaming and that kind of thing? Uh, it's that's a tough one. Um, I definitely think. Uh, the packaging right now of, uh, you know, of, of movies and, and feature films and documentaries to sell to a digital streaming um, market. Uh, it's so much more accessible. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, you, I mean, you have like what, we, what we're describing is, is people being cooped up mm -hmm. and not being able to go out and not being able to buy some popcorn and some and a Coke. Uh, and so <laughs> It's and that's what I was saying. Like the resurgence, yeah, I, I think the resurgence is go, is going to be there. But I also still think that uh, the market and the the industry is still going towards digital media uh, uh, platforms. Yeah, and you know, um, Johnny is a really extroverted person. If you don't know him, and no, I'm, I'm pretty not really, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I'm a Get pretty out of here. yeah, yeah. And what I'm a pretty introverted person. No, but you're he, not. you love he, large groups of people. I know, but love he, he, even me, um, <laughs> I do more enjoy seeing a movie um, in the movie theater, uh, going out with Absolutely. other people, uh, you know, getting the coke and the popcorn and the pickle and all that stuff. Then, Twenty bucks yeah, on snacks. Yeah, and the, the, you're right. the guy that buys that pickle. Yeah, I always yeah. wondered. <laughs> who actually buys it's that me. pickle yeah. um but um you know I, you know that's how i like to see movies is a a sort of a communal event so we can all kind of enjoy them together you know it's a social experience yeah you know sure. kind of like gasp at the same time yeah. you know or everybody's on the edge of their seat at the same time yeah. i think that that human element there is something that can't be replaced by you know you streaming a, a brand new movie on your couch at home alone and I think that that's why movie theaters are still around. Yeah, it's the experience. It, that's a that's the greatest the greatest feeling as a as a producer is like the humanistic aspect mm -hmm. of of seeing reactions and seeing how how the audience reacts to this and this moment and that moment. Uh, so I, t I totally agree with you. Yeah. So to to kind of segue into the point, Matt, the secondary topic we had we had chatted about earlier. Um, you know, you had excuse me. You want to go ahead and kind of fill us in on. On your current thoughts, we Matt and I were kind of chatting about the, uh, uh, yeah, about the the rise of the indie films over mm -hmm. the last you know decade, two decades, um, and in per in particular, uh, Blumhouse, okay, and uh, uh, David uh, Jason Blum and his production company. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar, the company that uh, do all of James Wan's films, The Insidious and The Conjuring, franchises. Paranormal Activity, right, right, Paranormal yeah. Activity, um, pretty much every major the horror Invisible film that, Man recently, right? That was a twenty four actually. 
Oh, I'm, re- I'm pretty sure get it's out. A I thought that was bl- okay. Was it? I thought it was eight. Anyways, anyway. um, but yeah, they're they're up there. They they're they're doing yeah. them. Um, so so yeah, Matt, why don't you kind of uh, uh, fill us in on um, on where you were looking at with them? Well, so so let me give you some statistics. Paranormal Activity in 2007 uh, grossed 193 million worldwide, mm-hmm. based on a 215 thousand dollar budget it's insane okay uh, right <laughs> uh what i what i call uh i call it tot timing meets opportunity meets talent and that's the key to success and and what that feature film had going for it was the rise of consumer uh media consumer like digital video cameras and stuff like right. that so they shot they shot that. If you look it up, it's the how, crazy how they shot that in San Diego. Like it's yeah. it's reg, regulation laws now. But um, they they used a uh, consumer product to create a a feature film. And and Blumhouse is his his theory of ROI uh, in this in this market is is taking these 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 features. We'll call it four million dollars. And they take it for four million dollars, and then they they turn it into a hundred million. You know, not bad. and not bad. Versus 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 the major well. markets, you know, your Warner Brothers, your Sony's, your Paramounts, your you know, et cetera. They obviously it's all union. They shoot this in a non-union aspect, and then flip it. Mm-hmm. But they can afford to flip it because of the ROI on the end, right? Because it's a small investment up front, so you can take more chances. Correct. Okay. Right. So, you know, one thing I, I was, we were actually watching this, uh, we were watching an episode, um, I was just telling Matt about this. Um, oh yeah. So is, uh, Jason Blum had an interview, um, actually on the, uh, on the Ben Shapiro show about three months ago, four months ago or something I like that. I think it was only like, uh, three or four yeah. weeks ago. I think time is just so no, fast no, in 2020. Wasn't. I'm gonna go back and look. There, is this the Mandela effect? Yeah, yeah. Where we're I think like so. in, oh, another, in, in oh, your universe no. is three weeks, but mine is three months. I, I, I worked on that feature, oh Mandela effect. <laughs> that was that first ending. Oh my yeah. god. Um. So, and, you know, I mean, I'm not. I, I actually, I have, I really have not watched him recently. But uh, I, we had found the. I guess on YouTube it popped up, and Gary had shot it over to me, and he actually goes on. He talks about um, the hunt, which is Blumhouse's most recent film that came out right before or it was like right before the invisible man and right before coronavirus happened right, and yeah. the quarantine was in, intact um and it was actually mm. a pretty interesting episode you know they i mean they they got in they got into the political end you know he being democrat and and uh shapiro just being uh on the right with republicans and stuff and they, they were talking about the politics in hollywood but the big thing that they were chatting about was the philosophy behind how blumhouse had become right. so effective mm-hmm. um, it was a very interesting uh, episode if uh, you have a chance to look at it because blumhouse was basically saying um or blumhouse blum is his actual name right. uh he was you know basically saying you know we we're more nimble than the big guys so right. we can afford you know, if if a movie we put out is, t- you know, flops, we're only out, you know, a couple of million dollars as opposed to, you know, if tens of millions. Yeah. Like if Endgame had flopped, they'd have been out, you know, maybe a billion dollars. So, you know, you can you have the opportunity to, to take more chances and tell a story that might not appeal to as broad an audience as, say, uh, the the uh, Avengers movies do. But th- it it's also a deeper audience you know you might be able to tell a more narrow story that's more you know intriguing to those group of people yeah i think also like his strategy is is content is king Mm -hmm. he he puts he throws a lot of darts on the wall and like you know if if one you know gets uh you know 200 and you know whatever 20 27 million you know versus another one that gets 10 but you're still over your your 4 million roi mark uh, it's you know he's still making money. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, because you know one thing that I had always admired about about him, which is the same thing, and you know we'll we'll tie this back into today's current topic and another episode from the past. Um, in the '60s, during the rise of the indie films, mm-hmm. when the studio system finally collapsed, yeah. um, you started to see um, mm. you started to see the the Gregory Pecks and even the Alfred Hitchcocks and like big name actors and directors go out on their own and come up with their own production companies. And now we're starting to see 
the rise of not only those famous actors and producers doing it, but everybody's coming up with their own production companies. And they don't have to be confined or constricted to the laws of the executives of Hollywood anymore. Right. It doesn't have to be a cash cow every single time the movie comes out. It can be something really out there like uh, like Get Out mm. or um, or The Hunt. Right. You know, even if it's mm. even if it's it's criticized heavily by, you know, this area of society mm. or these two areas or whatever, um, they can take a chance on it because like Gary said, you know, they they're not going to lose as much yeah, money. They, they don't need everybody to right. see it. And I, I think it's um, you're seeing this with a lot of different segments of society, the things that are created, like um, if you play video games at all, um, the platform Steam, which is a, a video game platform, you can buy indie games off of it. So, mm -hmm. you know, you can find games that just like some some guy made in his garage over two years that's like a really weird game like... Um, you know, papers, please, where you we play a border crossing guard in Kazakhstan in 1985 and you check people's <laughs> documents. You know, you, that's I not, are you telling me about yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, that, that's not going to. And they develop like cult followings yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah. Oh, my God. It sounds, ex sounds exciting. It sounds, Dude, it is it's awesome, awesome yeah. by the way. Like, you, you would never have a. <laughs> Can I buy some credit? Yeah. <laughs> but you would, I need to see your passport. <laughs> papers, please. Papers, please. But you, you'd social. never have a major game company, you know, put in a hundred million dollars making that kind of game. Cause that's a very niche game. And I think that with the, the rise of streaming, you know, Netflix and, um, you know, Amazon prime and all of these things. And then also the lowered threshold to, to make movies, you're, you're going to see a lot more, a lot more content come out. That's a lot, uh, you know, it, it appeals to certain groups a lot more and a lot less trying to pander to everybody. So you're right. going to kind of get, um, I think I'm hoping that it'll be much more interesting content to come out. Cause I think it's been a good thing for the video game industry. And I think it will be a good thing for the movie industry. Yeah. I mean, if you're, t I mean, if you're talking about, yeah, if you want to see more interesting content, but if, you know, if you're, if you're somebody that, you know, wants to not see a monopoly or a stranglehold on any type of, of business, especially the film industry where it's, you know, I, yeah, at one point was controlled by really the five mm -hmm. major studios, but at this point, it, it's pretty it's pretty well well developed um, and I mean, spread out. It's varied. It, yeah, I mean, you can yeah. have like a little company in Austin, Leadfeather, like make, Leadfeather Productions. Yeah, make make yeah. a uh, you know an internationally award winning short film, yeah. Eye of the Beholder. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, and that's just something we filmed, you know, on you know an ultra low budget and two, I think two thousand dollar yeah, budget, like I yeah, twenty five hundred or so, and yeah, and you know we 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 got that out there and that's uh you know if you haven't seen it i encourage you to go watch it it's on our youtube but like uh, leadfeatherproductions.com yes uh, and like it's it's a very we're not going to be those guys weird we're not going to plug our <laughs> but like it's a very kind of weird niche movie that right. we were able to make and we didn't have to um you know have studio backing to make it no we didn't and no. i and you guys i think have also kind of had opportunities to kind of you know explore your craft by not having to be as constrained um with what is um broad base appeal right yeah. or not maybe there's no, there's no, <laughs> no well, well, well all what i was gonna say well, actually it's kind of an interesting thought side thought to run off of though that is uh, something uh, to tie along with is when you talk about steam and papers please mm -hmm. for example i a i love that game thank you for calling it Anytime. out it is awesome but b uh the interesting part is with steam there's not really much of a a bar that you have to achieve to get on True, it right yeah. which is interesting because all you have to do is just put anything on there like and it's there right. like they're not yeah like you just you're there boom you're right. good but on things like netflix they have required cameras you have to have you know, you cannot uh, submit Mini. something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you got to be on an Alexa Mini, which for a while, the Alexa Mini even didn't and even need, technically fit and their guidelines. Need yeah, you, too. You, ha you have to be on a certain bar. So even if you are, you know, you could be the guy working in the basement doing something, but you still need a $40,000 camera to get right. there. Yep. So well, maybe there's a, there's a definitely better. a bar, yeah. but it's it's an interesting lower bar because it it's still a lot higher than the video well, I think game market. Netflix, well, I think net Netflix is currently... When you talk about look, you talk about oh, look. Oh, for sure. And I think with them, you know, they it lately it seems like they've kind of been just throwing shit at the wall and seeing what sticks. Every once in a while they come out with, you know, a really good movie um but you know with amazon like amazon prime anybody can put a movie on amazon prime at yeah. this point and they're just not going to put it on the streaming service directly they're going to put it on the hey 
come on here and you yeah. got to rent it. You got to pay three bucks and then Amazon takes a percentage of that. Um, so yeah, I guess Apple TV, uh, yeah. right? YouTube, you can do it for free. You can put anything up you want. True. You can True. film it on a, a an I, iPhone one. I think it's just it's kind of saturated on YouTube right now, so it'd probably be hard for random people to find your movie. Unless they were hey, fun fact, I actually filmed a major inter- er, maybe international national commercial for a mm-hmm. fast food chain. Part of it was shot on an iPhone one. Okay, okay. No, no way. way. <laughs> yep. To be fair, <laughs> it was the security cam footage used for another shot. Mm. But technically, okay, yeah. technically, <laughs> it was not a camera. A camera was an Alexa Mini. But B camera. Six, six, six B cam. Yeah. Yeah, B camera was sick an iPhone B-cam. 1. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, you, it gives you, like, access to so many more, like, and you get a lot, there's a lot of crap going to be made. I'm not saying that it's going to all be good and worthwhile, but, like, you know. No, that's why it's called crap. Yeah, I mean, it's just like, <laughs> but hey, this is the the creative breath of humanity kind of al- being allowed to be exposed a little bit more right. and more freely. Right. And, uh, you know, you don't, now, you know, and I mean, and nowadays, like you're saying, you know, there's, there's just so much content out there that it is, it's a good thing. It's a blessing and a curse. You know, it's, it's really easy to get your stuff shown to other people, but at the same time, everybody's doing it. So it's hard to get your movie seen, Mm -hmm. you know, unless people know about it directly or you have some type of, you know, like, like Matt, you were talking about like the digital advertising that they're currently using for the indie films. Um, Yeah. I mean, uh, the, 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 the strategy that uh, I guess I slash uh, the industry is using is, hiring these bts crews so you hire a bts crew uh two cameramen uh and then you you cast one of your you, you know your top three uh cast members in in, in your feature mm-hmm. as a social media influencer and and then you plug on both ends of of you know social media like hey we're on that and like what this, this look what we're doing and mm-hmm. you know uh, you create post distribution buzz on the front end. Right. Mm-hmm. And so instead of paying hundreds of thousands of dollars on the back end for distribution, uh, you, you, you kind of, you do it on the front. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, what's, what's crazy, I guess. So the, the next question is for, for the most recent indies, um, since, I mean, BJ, you've been doing this for, God, well over a decade at this point. You've been on a fair amount of indies, and you've obviously, when you first started out, when you were younger, you had been on, obviously, you were telling us you had been on Friday Night Lights, and you had been on, uh, you had done Machete and Boyhood and stuff like that. So do we, starting out in those major big Hollywood or big network type series and, and films and stuff, what was the transition like what was the contrast for you between jumping from that and then jumping into your first indie film when you were you know what in your early 20s i guess well, it's, teens, or? it's a it's a bit of a totally different ballpark okay. i mean but the thing the main thing is is that i came when i was on those i'd already been for a while working on like commercials and music videos sure. which uh Ooh, i would say indies world. are a lot world. closer to a music video than they are to a like well depending on size i mean honestly the indies that i was dealing with when i first came into it were a lot closer to a medium scale music video than they were to something like friday night lights that has multiple crews and multiple 40 foot long trucks that are all Mm -hmm. sorts of different locations with things moving you're like with an indie you're like hey man we're here there's like some small you know we we have like we have plenty of equipment but yeah, yeah, you have like a first and a second. You don't have a third unit. Yeah. You don't have, it, you know, it, we don't have nine different cameras with six dolly grips running 200 foot long sticks of track that are laying across Salty fields 80s. and getting. Yeah. And that's only that's only the B unit that had the nine cameras. The like mm. A unit was doing other stuff. So like, you know, it's just kind of a different world. You're more of you're doing that. But it's it's not a, a big jump. But it also comes down to kind of like I was talking about with wearing more hats. You know, you've you mm-hmm. don't have the crew size. So on, uh, for example, sticking something with camera related, you know, on Friday Night Lights, you had your loader that loaded the film that brought it to the second AC, who the second AC got it propped up while the first AC was pulling focus for the operator who was taking instructions from the DP and who was getting his instructions from the director. I've worked on I've worked on indies where those are all the same person. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, all of them and you know it's just kind of like learning about whichever one you kind of go right. on, you kind of go through you know you kind of figure it out going back to matt's points of of the multiple hats you know mm-hmm. 
So, Matt, for you, going from, because primarily when, you know, you had, and you had just commented when BJ had said the commercial in the music video world. So, for someone like you that makes their bread and butter in music videos and commercials, for you, what's different, since you're not on the camera side, really, what's what's different for you when you jump from that type of level of a production all the way over to an indie? What is it a huge, drastic shift for yourself and your departments, or how does that work for you? Oh. Well, I mean, uh, definitely living in that, uh, that world for a solid, solid 24 months. Um, it's, it's different. Like I was describing earlier between feature films, uh, indies, uh, music videos, commercials, uh, it's, they're all different, but what I've been noticing a trend is, is people wearing multiple hats, uh, right. specifically, uh, I've, I've had line producers now that that AD and I've, I've done this right. before in the past, um, just to kind of streamline the process you take, you take it, you know, you, you cut your budget by this much, um, and you can focus on the, the, the day we need to make this day, you know, I, I'm a numbers guy, but I'm also a time guy. And so you, 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 you focus on, on those aspects. Uh, it, it, it I don't think it works so much uh, in the feature film world, mm -hmm. but in commercials and music videos, uh, it, it definitely has kind of like transcended. Yeah. With a small, I mean, with a small enough crew, you, mm -hmm. you have to work with what you're given. You right. got to play the hand you're dealt. Absolutely. Um, so I, I just, for, just for fun, uh, to the, your best recollection, uh, BJ, we'll start with you. What is the, what's the most number of jobs, the largest number of jobs you've ever had on one set? Oh, Jesus. I've done. <laughs> I mean, hell, I tell you what, I'm currently pitching a job um, mm -hmm. that uh, we'll see how it goes. Okay. It's uh, the pitch, the process of now. So you've a, got the fact that it's a small crew independently run that is dealing with coronavirus okay. constraints. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the crew consists of me the producer who is also the makeup artist <laughs> and the client who is the talent. So wow. I'm everything else. Okay. So <laughs> sound, <laughs> sound, <laughs> camera, sounds great. Art. It sounds great. We're, oh, we're using a table that I actually had made from a last client job that I'd done <laughs> for product stuff. So I'm art the art guy. Art I'm the art guy. I'm the oh prop guy. I'll probably take the lighting truck. So Ooh. I'm dealing with all that, so the grip. Oh uh, I mean, literally everything, so, so uh, except I'm not editing. Okay. I wasn't editing, except he made a sample to show me and then said, well, so man, well, editing sucked. Can you edit too? Well, if you need an and editing like, service, oh. just let us know. I hey Leadfeather, you guys may you guys may be down. Um, the, also, their number is going to go up if I'm editing, mm, so we'll find yeah, out about well, that. But yeah, so let uh, us know. all of that. <laughs> Anyways, so okay, so so we probably safe to say a dozen yeah. rules at this point. E everything but two yeah. or three. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, uh, Matt. What about you? I mean, uh, it definitely depends what what medium you're in. You know, feature films, commercials, TV. Yeah, pick your uh, most stressful one then. But uh, is it like, am I dealing with uh, dealing with clients, and I'm dealing with the you know the 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 label? Uh, mm -hmm. I would say, yeah, I would say. And four hundred extras. <laughs> yeah, and oh, oh yeah, oh, and we got four hundred extras, and and no second seconds, you know. Oh god. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's crazy. It's crazy. Like, like the, the people at, at the top, the EPs, like what they expect of you, what they want from you, why they hired you. And they, and, oh, trust me, they remind you like, oh, this is why I hired you because you can do this, right? You can do this, right? Hmm. Uh, it's, 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 it's disgusting, uh, but also empowering if you can get the job done. Sure. So do you think that it, despite having to wear so many hats, if you have enough um, prep time to get ready for it, that that uh, will help out on, you know, sort of those situations where you do have to do multiple roles at once. So when it actually comes to production time, you've planned everything out as much as you can. Or do, is that still well, like, too much? Well, me specifically with music videos and commercials, like they always cut your days. They cut they cut your your pre and your in your post prep, sure. uh, just to save on the on the on the line. Um, so it almost is like 
you know, it, it, it kind of hurts you, yeah. but also like lights a fire under your ass. Uh, but yes, if we did have those pre and post days uh, for prep, I would say yes. Okay. Yeah, and I, I agree with that. I mean, absolutely. Uh, you can have more prep time. It will abs- It will help for sure. Scout. But when it really comes to it, yeah, like, oh, like having a scout day to actually go through and check out your locations and learn and make notes over what's happening. Mm-hmm. That's like something that a lot of smaller things can't afford to pay an entire crew to come in right. just to look at it and go, yep, that's what I'm going to do tomorrow. <laughs> yep. So, uh, yeah, but on the day when things are really happening and it's all framed up, you can do a whole lot of prep work, but a lot of decisions are going to be made in those very few minutes, right? When you finish setting everything up and the camera's up and the people are ready that you can't possibly prepare for. You can do your best, but things are going to come up that you weren't expecting. Okay. And then adding, adding, adding client village. You have, you have some dickhead EP that's like, you know what? Like, what if we did it this way? Like, it'd yeah. be good <laughs> this way. And you're like, yeah, sir, have you, like, have you been on set? <laughs> Do you know what you're talking about? <laughs> Get out of my way. <laughs> I don't care if you got a bunch of money. <laughs> Get the hell out of here. You know? well, one of the best things I've ever seen in my life, I got to work on uh, a job in San Antonio a while back where the, it was a really high budget DP, really high budget, everything really crazy. Mm. And the clients were basically doing that last minute. Hey, you know, we really want to do this thing. And he looks at them and goes, you guys had three weeks in meetings to ask me that. I don't want to talk to you now. And he goes, put up a 12 by between me and the clients. I don't want them talking to me for the rest of this job. And I was like, oh my God. And they were like, oh my God, he's so cool. The clients loved it. What? He was was smoking cigarettes the whole time. We'll never forget it. So I guess um, it, it can certainly be more stressful working on you know smaller, more indie kind of films because you've got to you know wear more hats. But you also have fewer people that are you know coming in from corporate, we'll say, um, and giving direction. Um, so overall, which kind of which do you guys prefer a, a larger, more structured um, kind of corporate um, you know production, or do you like sort of the the lower budget indie kind of scramble Gorilla production? Style. Yeah, yeah. B- uh, BJ, we can start I, with you. Yeah, I guess I'll go for. It. I would say my happy medium is somewhere in the middle. I like to have enough of a budget that I don't have to compromise on quality. Uh, where I get to have the people that I have with me that can help me do what I need to do. And, but also where I don't have an absolute ton of like oversight feedback and changes. I like to have something. I, in fact, I I really don't like sometimes when I end up with like a one man type crew for like almost something like a, uh, like a little smaller like reality type world but where it's like you know you and a sound guy and that's it and you're like uh i'm gonna shoot something but i'm not really sure if that's the look that you're going for Field and there's some, yeah like a, and and they don't know either so you're just like we're just gonna shoot and hopefully it's right because i hate doing that and then you just go man well uh if i'm wrong no one's we'll gonna know yeah no one's gonna oh, know for like a month till somebody gets it and they'll just have to deal with mm-hmm. it and i'm like i'd like to have somebody looking over my shoulder saying that's exactly what i want and then i like to have a little crew with me that can help make it happen okay. and that's like the perfect amount for me okay How about- I, w- I will definitely ag- agree with bj uh i'm kind of in the middle uh my big thing is especially on my rates my my rates with my guys my team um is uh, I, I pay them for their time. You don't fuck with my time. Don't fuck with my money. Uh, but we can haggle on a kit, you know, like you can maybe, get, maybe give me that kit at a half price or like whatever, but I want a hundred percent energy, you know, good hearts, mm-hmm. good energy. Like it's, you know, um, but definitely, uh, and that's, that, that kind of goes back to my digital streaming thing. Uh, and kind of like the way the market is trending is, is, like these Netflix, these Amazons, these Hulus, these YouTube Reds, like they are picking up on these smaller projects that are, you know, are are, are being made for under four million dollars. Right. That 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 can be distroed for you know for fifty. Mm-hmm. You know. So do do you think that uh, going back to like the pay question, do you feel like you know it's generally the smaller productions that try and uh, 
uh, screw you with that, or is it the bigger productions, or is there no correlation? They're all screwing you, man. I can okay. get well, to that. Is it, is it, well, is it, is it is it union or is it non-union? That's my first question. I mean, any small budget is typically you're going to find at least in Texas is going to be non-union. I mean, mm-hmm. it's rare that you'll you'll come across one that even is. Yeah. It's actually union, you know. I don't know. I'm sure. I'm sure. Mm. I mean, actually, because they say they say, and BJ, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure they. I hear from a lot of people. It hurts to be SAG if we're yeah. an actor. It hurts to be a part of maybe not the unions for crew necessarily, but you know, SAG in particular. Yeah. I mean, here, it, 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 it uh, there's, it depends. there's not as many jobs yeah, at all. It, it, you know, it has a lot of paperwork yeah. and money to it. Well, if you're working. Yeah, mm-hmm. if you're working, but I mean, it also kind of depends on the 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 worst. Thing, I don't know. I could be wrong, and I'm kind of probably stating a lot here. That always gets me is like one of the worst things to hear on a phone call is when they say we're going to pay the union super low minimums because we're like eligible for some like ultra low thing, and I'm like, oh, great. <laughs> so those, yeah, that's how I feel. And but you know, some people like are fine with stuff like that. I don't know. I don't really know. I I kind of I only play union when I'm going big jobs. Sure. So I don't exactly. I don't very often play super small. Gotcha. So, um, okay. so let, let, let me pose a question um, because uh, we um, would I know Blumhouse going back to them a lot of times they will give people that work um, like the actors they'll give them points on how much money the, the, on the movie back makes end. yeah on right. the back end um, is that something that you know you guys you two speaking from your your experience is that something you'd be interested in doing so it's kind of taking a gamble on whether this is successful well, yeah, or not we'll give you a low day yeah. rate but you get you know 2% of all profits yeah. that merchandise or on the, the post show. exactly yeah. on the distribution it, it whatever could we flop make. and you get nothing or it could be you know a hundred million dollar yeah. success it could be a paranormal activity yeah. or a napoleon dynamite kind of thing you know i mean me personally um uh, i i think you know great work great success is based on your crew your energy sure. and and what you're in the in the product you create mm-hmm. and uh I mean, I might might be uh, might be wrong here, but uh, I actually do like that model. Uh, it's 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 it gives incentive to to do a good job. You know, I've I've been on set so many times with what I call them salty eighties. It's just you have this grip that's that's just you know he sits on it on 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 the lift gate and he's just he's just pissed off at the world because I thought that was just called grips. Crap. No, <laughs> I say that as a grip, by Shots the way. It's okay. <laughs> But, I also but, grip. Like, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I apologize. I apologize. I, I digress. Uh, but I mean, it, it gives it gives the crew unity. It gives them, you know, it's it's a team. It's a team sport. It's not there's not one b- person that is driving this production. Yeah, you might have this EP that's an asshole, but you, you might have this line producer that kind of like you know plays middleman in the middle of like, hey, look, like he's giving the money, but uh, and I know he's like talking a lot at, you know, Video Village about about uh, framing up, uh, but, you know, like we're looking for vision mm-hmm. and uh, I don't so know. It, what, it, what, so it, it might, depends on the group of people that you're working with and the script kind of thing. You might do that. <laughs> Well, that's why I'm, I'm more like on the indie, indie, you know, script, uh, you know, the, the okay. side of, of taking a project that's that's underdeveloped uh, with, uh, you know, money and whatnot and and taking some no name actors that, you know, you, you take this in, you know, an amazing DP, an amazing director. And then you take this project to like a paranormal activity okay. like you, you make it worldwide. Yeah, you something out of nothing. BJ, how about you? Uh, you know, I don't really deal with points on a lot of this stuff with things like that, just because for my general world, like, uh, you know, I've, the, the few indies and stuff that I've done have been more like glorified or like a larger budget passion projects. Passion projects. And I'm paid, I'm paid more, you know, closer to a rate or kind of a favor in helping out and working with people than with, than by points on stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Home, homie, right. Hooking people up, yeah. make, you know, kind of, Hey man, I'll cut you a deal. We'll work on this and you can help get me on something else, something here. And so like I've made money, but I've never really been to the world of negotiating points over things, but you know, it's, it's one of those things that just kind of comes to the, uh, like you have a crew and if you are not paying them all, if everyone's working on homie rate, they don't want to be there that long. 
So when you got, okay, yeah, man, no, we're going to make it happen. It's all a bunch of homies that are doing it for us. And all of a sudden it's hour 16 because like three homies Oof. didn't care to, sh- to do something that they needed. Your morale is completely gone. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, there's like, no one wants to do any of this stuff anymore. So you, the, there's, yeah, there's kind of a weird little a, middle ground you get. That's find. a big thing is set morale. Like you, you it can't is. you can't put a price on yeah. that. If you if you have a group of people that just hate being around each other and can't stand coming to work and low through the work month, yeah, mm-hmm. then it's it's going to suffer. Uh, so yeah, guys, we're unfortunately we're getting towards the end of our uh, time today. So I kind of want to jump into uh, our ending segment where uh, we let everybody uh, kind of uh, Matt actually don't think I told you about this. So surprise, surprise, um, we're going to be giving a um, surprise. M- Movie suggestions uh, from our panel and guest today. Um, so, Matt, since I didn't tell you about that, I'll let you go last. Uh, basically, let's try to uh, we're going to offer suggestions to our listeners uh, of really good indie movies they may not have heard of or just some of your favorite indie movies in general. Uh, BJ, we'll let you go first this week uh, since we had already kind of talked about this earlier. Since I talked to you, <laughs> and we, were cho- we were choking about different movies before this podcast exactly. started. Well, actually, to get even weirder with it, I changed changed my mind okay. i had one that i was going to pick and i had a backup that i was excited All for right. but i've decided in the true spirit of indies i'm actually going to go with an indie that i worked on a few years ago it's actually a really solid movie really? called tejano it's set in the, uh, this. It's the on the border of texas okay. and it's a thriller and it's just uh, a really fun cool movie uh, i got to work with uh david blue garcia who's the director and dp on mm-hmm. it it was a really small crew remember i talked about all those hats there was me the sound guy uh david who was directing and shooting and an ac and the, the crew was you know had, there was a makeup and art but that was about it like those were all singular people mm-hmm. they're not you know crews or things so a lot of hats were worn by a lot of people but uh, a lot of love went into the production and it Actually, you know, I think it's a really awesome Perfect. movie. Where, okay. can, where can our uh, our listeners stream this? All right, can they, is it on any um, streaming sort of platforms? Uh, or? According to Rotten Tomatoes right now, it says it's on Vudu and Apple TV, okay. but it was on Netflix for a while. Uh-huh. I don't know if it's gone away yet, and it was on Amazon Prime. Okay. So both of those have been there. Don't know if it still is. Okay, all right, very good. Tejano, all right, we'll look forward to it. Uh, Gary, how about you? <laughs> I'm going to recommend a movie that came out a couple of years ago called Swiss Army Man. Um, oh, I think I, I think that was independent, yeah. um, but <laughs> it, it's got uh, it's got Harry Potter in it and uh, Daniel Radcliffe. Yeah, okay. whatever you know. Anyway, it's a ridiculous um, farcical movie, um, but it's you know. Oh, you if you like the fart jokes, you're going to love this movie. Um, but it's, it's also a great good, film. Yeah. It also has a lot of heart and a lot of really interesting moments that occur. It's basically one living guy um, has a friend who's a dead guy, um, and they wind up, uh, you know, away from civilization, and they're trying to survive and, and to get back. And, you know, it, it kind of tells both of their, their stories about how they got there and who they are or were as a person. Um, and it, it's just, uh, you know, it, it, it's such an odd premise for a film, but I, I think it was, it, to me it was really interesting and I enjoyed it. Yeah, it, it was. Yeah, and it's, it's also co-starring Paul Dano. Um, mm-hmm. he, yeah. he was the preacher in There Will Be Blood, uh, the, the older brother in Little Miss Sunshine, fantastic actor. Uh, one of those guys that I think is going to be kind of like the next coming of the, the Christian Bales and the Joaquin Phoenixes okay. when he gets a little older. Um, what would you say? Sorry. I said okay. Oh, oh, um, I was agreeing. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, for once. Wow. Yes. I oh, know. Geez. Wow. Yeah. We rarely Ooh. agree. Actually, I feel like we agree all the time. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I don't know about that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> agree to disagree. <laughs> disagree. Um, so actually it's, that's why I said son of a bitch because Swiss Army Man was the one I was thinking of. So oh. maybe we should talk about these movies ahead of time. No, so we I don't like take this. each this other's. Fun. It is fun. Uh, it's okay. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I have a, I kind of like the last minute yeah, stuff. I, I it makes too. it more fun. Uh, I, I had a backup. Um, so if you guys have ever heard of the movie, uh, the big sick, uh, this is a movie that it was a uh, rom-com that came out in two, two, let me see uh, 2017 uh, and so it was from uh, uh, Kumail uh, Nanjiani the comedian from the show Silicon Valley uh, it's basically it was him and Emily V. Gordon who's <clears throat> a really good friend of his uh, they actually they call each other their um, their they're a set couple basically not actually romantically involved but you know set husband set wife kind of like a, a work husband yeah, or work wife yeah, same thing we all have those yeah um and so they actually 
actually co-wrote the entire script. It was based on a story. Basically, this uh, stand-up comedian meets the woman of his dreams in a club, and they end up getting really close, and she ends up having this... I can't remember the exact disease she has, but she has... Or she gets in an accident and goes into a coma. Mm -hmm. And so they were going to break up right before the coma, and he obviously can't leave now because he'd look like a complete asshole if he broke up with a woman in a coma. So the parents come into town, and Ray Romano's the dad, and... um, I, for the light, I, I can't remember the the mom. Was it Holly Hunter? Or? Betty White? No. 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 Yeah, Betty White. That would be weird. Um, and, so many spoilers, yeah. man. And uh, <laughs> so they. Well, the, and so the she synopsis. dies at the end of it, and, and it's really so, sad. Hey, if you haven't seen it yet, then it's your own fault. It's been out for four years. Um, so they end up. Yeah, he comes out and he ends up. You know, it's about the relationship that he develops with the parents and all he remembers the good times that he had with her. And, and then I won't tell you the spoiler for the ending, but, uh, it's, it's definitely, it's, it's a revelation of a, of a romantic comedy, uh, style because it's not in the standard formula or format of a romantic comedy script. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it doesn't follow the same thing that like how to lose a guy in 10 days or, of you know, 50 first days, 50 for, oh yeah, or yeah, or 50 first dates or anything like that. It's a little different. So yeah, I, I would recommend that one. Check it out. Uh, I enjoyed it. Matt, how about you? All right, you put me on the spot here. Uh, I'm gonna go with a uh, an indie that I worked on in 2017 uh, called The Mandela Effect. Oh, oh you yeah. weren't joking uh, about that. that. Yeah, I thought you were kidding. Yeah, I was. I wasn't joking. <laughs> okay. I wasn't joking. Dog. All right. Well, what's that about? <laughs> uh, written and directed. Uh, written and directed by David Guy Levy. Uh-huh. Uh, stars Charlie Hoffmer uh, from. Uh, was a Mad Men, uh-huh. uh, a few other, a few other, few other casts. Uh, but essentially, it's uh, the premise is uh, it's an other world. Like it's uh, a computer gamer Brendan and his wife Claire. Uh, they're grieving from their their daughter d- dying. Uh, Spoilers. As, as, uh, sorry, <laughs> as the uh, you know as the the couple recklessly rummages through Sam's possessions. Uh-huh. Brendan can't bear to fin- uh, finish the task due to an overwhelming uh, grief and sorrow. So he comes up on uh, Sam's copy of a, a childhood uh, classic called the Berenstein Bears. However, no. uh, the Berenstein Bears, yeah. the, Bar- the, the Berenstein Bears. Berenstein Bears. <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, the lead is grief stricken protagonists uh, to explore many other well known examples of the famous known the Mandela effect. Okay. Of thinking something, something's happening, but it, yeah. it's something really not. happened at one point, but mm. it didn't actually happen. Yeah. Yeah. We, that we, sounds like a very intriguing movie, actually. I think, yeah. We may have to watch that. We may have to watch that. We may have to skip Neil Breen tonight. Oh, and watch I don't the Mandela know effect. You can't skip the Breen. We got to watch Fateful Charlie Findings. Charlie Hoffman, uh, uh, Robin Lord Taylor, Clark Peters from uh, what was he in? Uh, Never. The HBO show. I'm trying Never to think. Heard the name. What was it about? Uh, the one with the police in Baltimore. The Wire? Oh, The Wire, yeah. That's right, The Wire. The Wire. Yeah, gosh, the Wire. Oh, thank you, Gary. Thank you. Gary. Thank, you. thank you. Nice. <laughs> really nice guy. Perfect, man. <laughs> but no, it's good. It, 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 it creates perspective on uh, on just like, you know, just like what we're actually seeing in the world sure. and uh, what's actually really going on in, in your head. Okay, interesting. Very All right. nice. We'll cool. Check that one out. I've, I've, I'd actually like to check both those out because they're not, it doesn't seem to be super big budget. Um, Grace, we can't thank you enough for both being on yes, this week's episode so and we much. hope to have you back soon uh, so from all of us here at I Don't Give a Flick I'm Johnny Blackburn and I'm Gary Elmore stay classy